homophobia is like having a bully down the road. The threat of secular thinking is like having brain cancer. Let me repeat that. So now all threats are equal. The threat of Islamophobia is like having a bully down the road. But the threat of secular thinking is like having brain cancer. So with that in mind, kind of give us this, the background of our program for today, which kind of is um, geared towards fixing and addressing those problems that might be going on through our minds and through our hearts in regarding to our aqidah. And for that, alhamdulillah, discussed in further detail, we have with us Dr. Muhammad Volkan, who was born and raised in Istanbul, Turkey. He received his undergraduate education at Bates College, graduating summa cum laude with honors in history. He completed his master uh, in f philosophy degree in classical and medieval Islamic history at Oxford University. At the University of Chicago, he studied in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, completing an MA degree and his PhD dissertation, which was recently accepted with honors, mashallah. In 2008, he traveled to Syria as a Fulbright Fellow to conduct research concerning the Hanafi School of Islamic Law. Dr. Volkan had the opportunity to study classical Islamic texts with Arab, Turkish, and Indian ulama. In Damascus, he benefited from the lessons of Dr. Nur ad-Din Itar and his student, Dr. Islam Rido, the blind scholar Hassan al-Hindi and Muhammad Naim al-Araqsusi. In Istanbul, he learned from Sheikhs Mehmet Savaz, Ahmed, I can't say all these um, Turkish names properly, forgive me please, Ahmed Akinsik, and there's a, mashallah, a long list of scholars, mashallah, he benefited from. Uh, last but not least, during his time in Chicago, he has studied with Sheikh Muhammad Amin Kulwadi also. Dr. Volkan's research interests including, include Islamic law and legal history, historiography, the instrumental Islamic sciences, hadith and its methodology, Islamic theology, and Sufism. So um, I guess the, his background shows us enough that Hamza is very, very qualified to be speaking to us in, on this topic. And shall we make dua that we all benefit from his uh, lecture? He's also currently uh, an instructor at Darul Qasim right down the road. And as we most know, Alhamdulillah, he's our Musalli here too. We are honored that we get to you know meet him almost every day. Alhamdulillah. Without further ado, Shaykh Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Estauzu billahi semil alim mina shaitani rajim. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Alhamdulillah, al rabbil akram. Al ladhi allama bil kalam. Allama al insana ma lam ya'lam. Wa qala lak. Wa lakad karramna bani adam. Wa salatu wa salama ala rasuli al akram. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَا عَلْهِ وَالسَّابِهِ وَاتْبَعِمْ اِجْمَعِينَ وَبَعْدْ Inshallah, um, tonight uh, I'm going to speak to you about a topic that I was asked to speak about, which is um, uh, secularism, modernity, and atheism, right? But uh, I think it makes a lot of sense that before we start talking about kufr, we remember all Allah's blessings. The greatest blessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us is what? Knowledge, Knowledge right? Uh, how do we know this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in the Quran, Estaizubillah wa lakad kerramna bani adam, right? We have indeed ennobled uh, the sons of Adam, children of Adam, the humankind, right? So, how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ennoble us, right? And the Qur'an, as you know, one of the rules of usul tafsir one of the rules of our hermeneutic methodology is what? That uh, Qur'an explains itself, okay? So, how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ennoble us, grace us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the f very first revelation that he revealed, 
Ekra bismi rabbikal lezi kalak, halakal insana min alak, ikra ve rabbukal ekra. Right? Your Rabb, your Lord is the most noble. Right? How does he display his nobility? El lezi alleme bil kalem. The one who taught by pen, alleme el insana ma alem yale. He taught mankind that which he did not know. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala displayed his nobility and generosity to the humankind foremost with knowledge. Right? So knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowledge of our reality, and knowledge of what we should do in that reality is the greatest blessings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam, Adam alayhi salam, all the names, right? And because of this knowledge he gave to Adam alayhi salam, all the angels bowed before Adam alayhi salam. Right? So the knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us is our greatest blessing. And through that knowledge we know ourselves, right? Through that knowledge we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through that knowledge we know his Enbiya, his Eulia. Okay, so now once uh, we say that, uh, we can say that all knowledge that we have, all knowledge that humankind has is about, we can categorize into two groups. What, is, what are these categories? Basically, what is the nature of reality we live in? And secondly, what are we going to do about it? Okay? So what is the nature of the reality we live in? And how should we behave in this reality? Right? And all of human knowledge is about this. Right? So um, the first one is what? Relates to Iman, Aqidah. The other one relates to Amal, action. Okay? And so how are we going to answer these questions? How are we going to uh, how are we going to learn about the reality we live in and how are we going to behave and act in that reality? So basically the, our answers to these questions will be determined by what? By our sources of knowledge. What we consider to be true knowledge. Okay? So what are the sources of knowledge according to Islam? In Arabic these are called as tulabul uh, ilm will know among you. Right? What? Esbabul ilim. Right? What are the esbabul ilim? The occasions of our knowledge. Basically, they are three. Right? What are they? Revelation, reason, and our senses. Okay? All our knowledge will return to one of these three categories. Either we learn something through revelation, right? Or we learn it through reason, through logic. Or we learn it through our senses, right? Through our five senses and through experience and experiments, which go back to these senses, okay? So when we um, combine these sources of knowledge, we get a comprehensive repository of knowledge, okay? Now, if we were to lose any one of these sources, if we were to disregard any one of these sources, our understanding of reality, our, our understanding of our own existence, will be much poorer. Okay? And you can think about this, right? Is the one who sees like the one who is blind? Is the one who hears like the one who doesn't hear? Right? So, um, the richer our sources of knowledge are, the richer our knowledge will be. And the poorer our sources of knowledge are, the poorer our knowledge will be, right? If that is the case, then we will know less about the true nature of our existence, and we will know less about how we should act in that reality, okay? So, Islamic knowledge, as we said, is what? Comprehensive. It includes all these three sources. It includes revelation, it includes reason, and it includes experimental, experiential, empirical knowledge. Okay? So, um, based on this knowledge, uh, we have our Iman. Right? Our Iman is based upon 
this knowledge, everything we know is based upon this knowledge. So once we uh, identify sources of knowledge, then uh, what do we learn from these sources about our iman? What is our iman? What is being a Muslim? Being a Muslim is what? Affirming and confirming the authenticity and the truth of the knowledge that the Prophet wasallam brings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? It is affirming with our hearts and minds and souls and confirming with our tongue the truth of the message Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam khatam al brought from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the essence of our iman. Right? So uh, essence of our iman is what? As you know, the shahada. Right? Let's say it all together. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abdu wa rasuluhu. Right? Right? We bear witness, we believe that Allah is one and there is no God other than him and that Muhammad is his final messenger and prophet. Okay? So that is our iman. Okay? So now, we know this is our iman, but should we be able to justify it? Or can we say it's enough to um, believe in the truth of the uh, message of the Prophet ﷺ? We don't have to um, show any proofs for it. We don't have to um, explain it in any way. Just believing it is enough, no matter how you believe. Okay? So this ulama have discussed this issue. And their response might surprise you. Okay? Right? What was their response? They said that if you cannot justify your knowledge, if you cannot justify, provide evidence and proof for your faith, then this is a sin. If you say, I'm a Muslim because my parents are Muslim, they say this is a sin. Why? Because the mushrik says the same thing. Right? The mushrik says the same thing. When uh, the Prophet wasallam brought the Quran to the Quraysh, those who did not accept Islam, what did they say? We're going to follow our ancestors. We're going to imitate our ancestors. Okay? So now, this is not sufficient. <coughs> now we do say, as long as a person has certainty, then he is a Muslim, he is a mu'min. So the most important thing is certainty in our faith. But with that certainty, we should also be able to understand that our faith is not based purely on imitation, but rather it is based upon proofs and truths and it can be explained, and it can be demonstrated. Okay? So now, how can we demonstrate it? Now, we don't need, right, this is a very important message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught to our Prophet, and He taught to us, His community, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we don't need to convince anyone. Why? Because the hearts are under the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can turn them any way He wants. Okay? So, it is not up to us to convince anyone. What are we responsible for? We're responsible for conveying. But we're not responsible for convincing. That is behind, beyond our power. Okay? We are only responsible for conveying and explaining. Okay? And we are all responsible for what? Thinking. And... Uh, and justifying our faith. Okay? So how can we justify our faith? It's very easy. It's very easy, right? How is it very easy? MashaAllah, half a sub in the second Jummah today read some ayahs at the end of Surah Al Imran, right? Um, which the Prophet Sallallahu used to read in his tahajjud, right? What were those ayahs? Anyone remember? Astaghfirullah. He said, What? In the Fialk is Samawati wal Ad, Waktilaf al Layli wal Nahari. Right? right? Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, 
and the alternation of night and day, there are signs for Ulil Elbab. Who are Ulil Elbab? Those who possess intelligence. What does that mean? Impartial people. Ulil Elbab are those people who are impartial, who don't approach things with stubbornness, who don't approach things with arrogance. They approach this with open mind. They are impartial. They try to be just. They try to be fair. For fair people. Okay? In the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alternation of night and day, there are what? Signs for impartial, fair people. Okay? Here is the proof. What's the proof? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the proof. And any person who reflects about the nature of our reality will see this proof. What is the proof? Our existence in the first place. Right? Where did things come to exist in the first place? Okay? Something happened before, something happened before that. How, how did the first thing happen? How did existence come out of non-existence? All right? So what is our answer? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of everything. Secondly, this should be proof enough that existence had a beginning point. So how can it uh, arise out of non-existence? But on top of that, how did it come about? It came about in a way that is astonishingly beautiful. Right? It came about in a cosmos that is what? So finely tuned. Right? How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explain this? In a language that everyone can understand? Iktilafu layli wa nahr. Alternation of night and day. The regularity of the universe. Okay? So, what does this tell us? Right? If you um, see, basically, um, a pile of leaves, right? Somebody who doesn't reflect might think these leaves just came here randomly. Right? Now, if you see a Boeing 747, right? Nobody thinks, well, you know, wind went over a junkyard and, you know, it was very um, lucky wind. And just all the junk came together in the form of a Boeing 747. Does anyone say that? No one says that. Why? Because all of us intuitively know that something complex that is regular doesn't occur by itself. Right? And this is a fact that everyone who is impartial and fair will accept in his life and will live his life this way. Right? Once I asked an atheist... Um, I offered them some apple pie, and I asked, do you think this apple pie made itself? And he's like, I don't think so. And I said, don't you think this universe is more complex than this apple pie? He said, yes. I said, so how do you believe this universe made itself? Okay, he said, it's very unlikely. Okay, but he still insisted on kufr. You see what I'm saying? That's what, why, I mean, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, uh, spoke the Quran, right? What does he say? There are signs, but for who? The ulil albab. For those who are fair, for those who are impartial, okay, who are not stubborn. Last time. Okay. All right. So that's what I'm saying, right? We don't need to like. Um, uh, give complicated answers. If we say the obvious answer, that's fine. Right? What's the obvious answer? When you go to a palace, you think there's an architect. Right? Now, anyone uh, who knows any physics or who just reflects about the nature of the universe, who just sees the beauty of it, will think, what? That it is much more astonishing and amazing and beautiful than any palace that we can build. Right? Okay. So that's uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. إِنَّ فِي عَرْكِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْعَرْضِ وَاقْتِلَا فِي اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَعَيَاتُ رُولِ الْأَلْبَابِ Okay? Now, there is also, I mean, just in one ayah, there is so much richness, right? This is um, the ijaz of the Qur'an. There is another element of this that you, you might uh, uh, not think about it. 
when you first hear it, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about this? In the creation of the night and day? In the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of night and day, there are what? Ayat. Right? Now, you think about the ayat, what are you thinking? You're thinking about the Quran. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls ayat what? The cosmos. Right? Right? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Right? Alameen. Alam is what? They say alam has, comes from the same root as ilim and alam. Right? Ilim is knowledge. Alam is sign. Right? So the alameen is what? Signs that lead us to the knowledge that there is a creator of those alameen. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls his cosmological signs with the same word he calls his revelation. Okay? So just as revelation is a, uh, consists of ayat, the cosmos also consists of ayat. Okay? And our knowledge comes both from what? Ayat, a teshri'iyya, the ayat based on revelation, related to revelation, and ayat, a tekwiniyya, which are what? Cosmological signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are both true sources of knowledge. Okay? We have to appreciate this. We have to understand this. Right? If we neglect either of these signs, if we don't do tafakkir of either of these signs, then um, we're not appreciating the true majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as you'll see, it will cause other problems. Okay? Alright? So now, um, Many times students have uh, this, this uh, question. We have these sources of knowledge, right? We said reason, revelation, and what? And the senses. Which one is the most superior? Okay? So now the immediate answer that comes to our mind is revelation. But that is not the case. Why? Because they are all true sources of knowledge. They are all true sources of knowledge. They don't trump each other. What do they do? They are in harmony with each other. Right? One truth cannot contradict another truth. Only a falsehood can contradict the truth. You follow? Okay? So these are all true sources of knowledge. And they are in harmony. If they are not in harmony, that means there is a problem with our understanding. Okay? Is that clear? Right. Right. Now, this is a very important uh, aspect that um, that ulama have emphasized, and uh, Sheikh Nureddin Uttar um, talked about this in uh, in Damascus. He said there is nothing in Islam that is against reason, but there are things in Islam that is beyond reason. Do you understand the difference? Against reason, beyond reason. There is nothing in Islam against reason. Meaning there cannot be any contradiction in our religion. If there is any contradictions in our religion, that means there is a contradiction in our understanding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is munazzeh, is clear of any faults. Okay? Is this in revelation? This is in revelation. How? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <laughs> Right? Falseness, contradictions will not come to this revelation from its front, from its back, from anywhere. Okay? Why? Because it is a revelation of what? The one who is all wise and the one who is praiseworthy. The one who is all wise will not misguide people with contradictions. That is not praiseworthy. What is praiseworthy? Truth is praiseworthy. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to his prophets. Is that clear? So all sources of knowledge work together in harmony. And if there is any contradiction between sources of knowledge, that shows what? We have a misunderstanding that we need to correct. Is that clear? Okay. Right? 
So just as we believe in Ayatul Teshriyi, Ayatul Qurani, we have to believe in what? Ayatul Tekviniyi. That the cosmos comprises what? Signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's oneness, His power, His creativity, His majesty. Okay? And we think about this again with fairness and impartiality of Tilafil Layli Wan Nahari, right? The alternation of day and night. The alternation of day and night is so beautiful, right? That during the daytime we can work, during the nighttime we can rest. During the daytime Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this source of light, the sun, right? During the nighttime, if we had sun, it would be more difficult to sleep, right? But for those who want to travel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still put the stars and He still put the moon. Okay? So we think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings and, you know, we can never s stop speaking about them. Okay? So this is um, uh, um, basically uh, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, which is what? Kharkulade. Kharkulade. Kharkulade is what? Khalk is creation. And Ade is what? Those things that happen regularly. Khalkulade. Khalkulade, right? The creation of regularity. Right? The creation itself is a proof, but the way that it's in such a regular way is what? Greater proof. Okay? So now, that is the proof of what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence. What is the proof of the prophets? Kharkulade. What is what? Kharkulade. Which is what? That they demonstrate that their method, their uh, message is authentic by those things that changes the regular way the universe works. Right? That is called what? Mujize. Mujize is what? Kharkulade. It changes the regularity, the regular way the universe works. So the prophets, each one of them, corroborated, demonstrated, verified the truth of their message by how? By kharkulad. Why? How does this make sense? Makes a lot of sense because we did not create this ade, right? We did not create the regularity of the universe and we can't change it either. Okay? So who's the only being that can change it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Does it make any sense for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change the order of the universe for someone who lies intentionally in his name? You follow? Somebody is going to consistently lie about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is Hakim is going to change the order of the universe for that person. Is that possible? That's not possible. Okay? Right? So, uh, we say what? That the Anbiya alayhi salam demonstrate the truth of their mission, how? By harkulat, by the mujze, by miracles. Okay? The Arabs are a very interesting group of people in history. In which respect? In this respect, they have an amazing love for their language. Right? They had the love of their language that was what? More than any other people in the world. Now you're going to say, how do we know this? Well, think about this, that we have many proud nations of, in the world, right, that had long histories, many worldly successes, so on and so forth. They were all fine with accepting a religion in another language. Think about the Greeks, long civilization. Romans, long civilization, big empire. What did they accept? Christianity, right? What were their language? Latin and Greek. What, did, what was the language Isa alayhi salam spoke? Aramaic. Okay, so they accepted the revelation in another language. Think about the Chinese, right? Chinese long uh, civilization. They accepted Buddhism. Where did that come from? They came from India, right? Right? So all these like Iranians, think about this. Iranian long, uh, very long history, big civilization. They accepted what? Arabic revelation. But the Arabs would not accept a revelation if it wasn't in their language. All these proud nations with long civilizations, they accepted uh, religions from other languages. Arabs did not want to accept any religion that was in their own language. 
This is a historical fact. Okay? So all the um, peoples around them had different religions, they didn't accept it. Okay? So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows his, the mujiz of his prophets. We see in areas where people think they're most powerful. Okay? So the Arabs thought they were like most powerful, most accomplished in where? In their language. Right? And then what happened? The Prophet came with a revelation that was in Arabic and said, if you think it's not from Allah, bring something like it. You are the speakers of this language. You love this language. You think uh, you're proud of this language and how you speak this language. You hang your poems on the Kaaba. Right? This is how much they love their uh, literature. Bring something like this. Right? Were they able to do this? They weren't able to do this. None of them. None of them were able to do this. Some tried, became laughing stocks. Okay? Right? Right? There is nothing in the Arabic language, or for, in a, uh, for that matter, in any language, that is like the Noble Quran. Right? So the Noble Quran is what? Inimitable. It is a mujza in itself. And it is a great blessing. Why is that a great blessing? Because when we look at the other miracles, right? of given to prophets, they happened at one time, at one point. Right? So the Musa alayhi salam, the sea parted. Isa alayhi salam raised the dead, so on and so forth, right? Now, how do we know about this? The only way we can know about this is from other people. So, and then, or from revelation. So we're either going to believe those other people, or we believe in the revelation. That's the only way we're going to know, but we, we can't see it, right? But the miracle of the Quran, is with us and it will be with us until the day of judgment. Right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said what? We, we reveal this remembrance, we will protect it. Okay? So it is a miracle as the final uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this miracle is with us. Every human being can what? Can see its miraculous nature if they make the effort. If they make the effort, they can see it. Okay? So now we talked about proof of um, the oneness of God, we talked about what? The proof of the prophets, okay? So now, let's talk about um, uh, this issue of what? The spread of atheism, the origin of atheism, so on and so forth, okay? So now, 